Thanks, Bill. Um, I want to give a little bit of background and context, and um, we're not going to use slides, so we're going to have a little bit of show and tell, um, just to let you know how far we've come in, a, in about 140 years. The, um, and this, some of this is a history of the continuing war between analog and digital. It will never be resolved because it's always going to be both. But in first transatlantic cable, um, this is a piece of it, um, pulled up off the ocean floor in 1960s sometime. Uh, it's got copper down the middle and rubber in between and then a steel jacket on the, the side. It uh, could do maybe 10 bits per second. It was actually a variation of two vol voltages with a mirror galvanometer on the other end. And um, <clears throat> so it was Morse code, basically. Nice that we we're talking about uh, this in the, so near, close to the Morse household. And uh, 1866, this got pulled across the Atlantic. This was the second time at doing it. The first time snapped and they couldn't recover it. And this was in play for a century across the ocean. Somewhat more recently, um, Nisenet was involved in a deployment in New York City, and this, and I'm holding them up so you can compare the radii, they're the same, is what we pulled in Manhattan. It's 864 strands of glass, every one of which has essentially, especially compared with this, an infinite carrying capacity. And uh, some of my users, are in the audience out here that, that are using strands of glass from this. Um, both Rob and uh, my CTO, Bill Owens, are, get really irritated with me when I clip a segment out of our Manhattan fiber to do one of these things. And it's, <laughs> Mark's going to go back on the train with it immediately so we can splice it back in. <laughs> but um, it's a different world. And I actually think that the, the the switching to light changed it all. The, the, the lasers get faster. They're still analog, but it's basically on and off still. So we're, we're still using Morse code, more or less, in, in this. It's just, uh, you know, the person on the keys, much quicker fingers on the keys. And we've come this astonishing way. I think this changed a lot of things. It changed the kind of problems that we could take on. The, the Large Hadron Collider is in the process of, of gearing up. Its um, next run is going to be um, significantly more powerful than more energy than the last one. You know, personal guess is they're going to find Higgs boson on the next um, run of the of that collider, and the data flows that are coming out are are gigantic. The flow across the ocean into our peering point in, in New York City and get uh, transmitted to other places from there. There are problems in in healthcare. Um, you just had a you just upgraded your connection. This, this is Mount Sinai to a to to a gig, and I, I think you're about to fill it because of one researcher who's got um, you know a gene sequencer under the desk and figured, you know, let's just stick it to the network again, pushes the button, now there's another petabyte of data. So, and the computing power at the other end has grown vastly greater. It, um, it enables one to, to look at, say, do an experiment that might take two months. Well, now you can run it in two minutes, which means that you're going to look at many variants of it and come up with something that's much richer. It's not just quantitatively different, it's qualitatively different. And about 10 years ago, um, many of the regional networks, uh, Nisenet included, started to acquire fiber. So we, we acquired, we built out with a business partner, Lexant, in New York City. Uh, we, we built out the, this fiber build that was really a custom build for the healthcare, r &E, cultural, community in New York, and, and it's still growing. Um, our paths crossed with Rob's when Rob um, Lighttower bought Lexant not long ago, and I think that uh, the, the partnership that we enjoyed 
with Lexant is just as rich with Light Tower, but with a broader footprint. So, um, you know, significant builds through the Hudson Valley to the IBM research facilities, for example, where there are going to be very large data flows. And they got long haul fiber, um, we did, uh, running along the throughway. Um, George Loftus is here, he's got fiber that he bought for Niren about the same time that we participated in. A lot of the regionals um, acquired their own fiber, lit it, started providing um, very, um, usually at sort of a revenue neutral level, much an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude, more capacity to the members for research and education. The last couple of years, BTOP goes back, what, three years, Mark, yeah. perhaps? Um, the part of the stimulus money was funds given to the Department of Commerce for the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program, or BTOP, which has um, invested in middle mile, some last mile infrastructure in a number of places. It's um, changed um, the outlook very significantly for uh, what they're doing for some of the regional networks. Uh, it is not the case of what we're doing in New York. I think we've got partners, the BTOP award winner um, in the southern and northern tier and uh, Rob in, in Light Tower in the other parts of New York State which didn't qualify for the, um, just because of penetration of broadband, didn't qualify for the BTOP grants, but it's been a, a rich partnership where we're worrying all the time about the research questions that the member institutions are worrying about or the, their educational problems or international education. Uh, the peering point is becoming increasingly important. And Rob is worrying about the middle mile, reaching, reaching sites like the Yorktown Heights research facility for, uh, for IBM. And Mark was a program director at uh, NTIA for the BTOP program for a couple of years. And um, I guess maybe what I'd like to do is start, Mark, with you to ask, you know, what was the vision? How close do you think we've come and what are the problems that you see right now? And then I'll turn it back to Rob to get his interpretation on specifically here in New York. Okay, thank you, Jim. I'm going to back up uh, one notch in my career before that. I started as a uh, university CIO when I got in this business at uh, Madison, Wisconsin last. There I uh, went on a two-year loan to the National Science Foundation in their networking division. This is about late 1995. That was an exciting time because it is when NSF uh, decommissioned NSFNet and turned over the internet to private industry. So it was very uh, heady, interesting times. And also, uh, it's interesting that it was so recently because uh, look what the internet is now. One thing NSF did then is to host some workshops to try to figure out the future of research and education networking now that the NSF backbone is no longer government. And uh, these workshops, I think, led to the advent of research and education networking as we know it today. And they uh, are the precursor or sort of a high-level blueprint for how to accomplish many of uh, our objectives in this area. And, Tim uh, said some of the words just now in his introduction. There are things like uh, find a dedicated fiber. Yeah, own the fiber or lease the fiber, but control the fiber so that you're uh, not subject to the uh, price per bit of a uh, lease T1 line or something like this. And you can upgrade the electronics. <coughs> Often these uh, networks are run by a consortium or a nonprofit organization or a corporation that is uh, friendly and supportive for research and education. And together, these things give you a very fast and very affordable network. This is building into the uh, BTOP goals as well. Uh, this was done on the campuses, as you know, by the CIOs. Uh, 
Now, one anecdote from Wisconsin to show the state of the art back then, our uh, academic network was so distributed that each department wired its own buildings and set their own standards. So all of our uh, network access plugs in the walls uh, did not behave the same way. You'd have to bring a special plug according to which building you walked in. We've made progress since then. The uh, regional networks were really important, and uh, NISERNet, of course, is a clear uh, example of that, but they, they uh, were built around the country, starting with the NSF grant and then uh, on their own. There were national networks such as Internet2, and we in uh, NSF hosted an organization called the Kern. It's the Coordinating Committee for International Research Networks. And roughly speaking, we planned how to interconnect networks from other countries to ours. Uh, again, all for research and education practice. There was a group in the, uh, my present organization, NIDRD, which coordinated the uh, United States government research and education networks. And there were about five of large ones then and quite a few small ones. They were done as silos with each agency building its own network for its own scientists. And we uh, set up a group called L LSN to combine them, first interconnect them, and finally merge them. So uh, that was sort of background, but it led to a very, uh, again, fast, affordable research education infrastructure for uh, communications, computation, data, collaboration. And that going into BTOP was a goal. There, one goal in BTOP you probably all know about is uh, bring broadband network consumer grade to people that don't have it. There are uh, many areas, including in New York, where uh, access is difficult to achieve. And we were going to try to improve that. Because uh, the administration believed that the uh, broadband networking is the key to long-term growth, economic growth. And we were fortunate that uh, BTOP was funded out of ARA. Was, that money was to provide jobs right now with, through construction projects and things like this. But by constructing broadband networks or other uh, communications or transportation infrastructure, you uh, get the gift that keeps on giving and leads to uh, long-term growth. One of the uh, big arguments at the beginning of BTOP is uh, how strictly should we stick with the goal of reaching the unserved population and versus the underserved? And what does underserved mean anyway? That's uh, turned out to be a large discussion. But it got uh, clarified, I think, in the right direction when we focused on uh, community anchor institutions. These were uh, organizations, they include universities and colleges, but went beyond to uh, hospitals, government uh, buildings, public safety, K-12, libraries, basically uh, institutions often owned by the public, but sometimes private, uh, for the public good. And the idea is could we take these research and education uh, capabilities that grew up through the university consortium and provide that kind of access to that kind of price, that kind of bandwidth, to the other anchor institutions. And uh, BTOP defined under, underserved for anchor institutions to be uh, a much higher bar than you don't have a, a DSL line in your house. We were talking about 100 megabits and sort of more modern numbers. And there we found out that a lot of uh, anchor institutions in the United States are not well served. And we were able to argue that uh, if, even if they could get it, but they can't afford it, it's worthwhile building a, a BTOP style network. So uh, that's one thing BTOP did. It took their research and education network infrastructure model, broadened the scope to include a lot more institutions. This leads to uh, great advantages for their anchored institutions, but uh, tension and uh, I'd say great opportunity and uh, great head scratching for some of the regional networks that have been surfing the R&E uh, mission alone. And the question is, could they take up the other mission, the rest of the anchor institutions, or partner with private industry, otherwise solve the problem that BTOP uh, put out as a challenge? So uh, coming out of BTOP, uh, 
the, the networks are still under construction, but uh, I do see it as a total game changer for anchor institutions as well as many consumer neighborhoods and that will allow them, these anchor institutions, to build communities of practice around medicine, and I don't mean medical research, I mean medical care, health care, education, public safety, uh, just the way the universities did with NICERnet and Internet2 around research and education. And I think it's going to lead to new applications to take advantage of this bandwidth. And that will be, and they'll be tailored to the communities and lead to more demand for networking. In my uh, new job, which I'll talk about a little later, we're looking at research and development into the next gen generation of things. And I believe that there are some uh, clues as to the kind of changes that might be coming in the network and the applications. Tim. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, a fair number of my board members in the audience. Um, board knows that uh, Eisenet actually did not seek any VTOP funding. Uh, we've worked very hard with the uh, one organization that, uh, that did seek and then got one of the major grants, um, ION, which is a consortium of rural ILACs in upstate New York, and their partner, the Development Authority of the North Country, with whom we had worked for a long time. And we looked at, for a while, trying to um, repeat on round two, uh, eventually concluded there, that we couldn't do it for a, a variety of reasons, but um, the biggest one, I didn't know, everything that we were proposing building, you were already building. And so um, yeah, I, I mentioned that you know, we built fiber out in Manhattan and, and then in Brooklyn, or in, in um, the Bronx with uh, Lexant, and then the Lexant infrastructure, Lexant was acquired by Light Tower, and uh, through Rob and his folks, we've, uh, the partnership has, has continued, and I, I think a, um, no, I've gotten no sense of hesitation by the board that this is the wrong direction to go, particularly since we've got the kind of partners that we do, and a rich, corporate research infrastructure in the Hudson Valley that we don't currently reach that your infrastructure will be reaching. So I want to talk a little bit about Light Tower and what your strategy was for taking that on. Sure. <clears throat> um, just a, a little background on, on Light Tower. Uh, the original Light Tower was owned by National Grid and um, they built a, a dark fiber network in Massachusetts about 10 years ago. And Grid decided to get out of the uh, tower and fiber business. Uh, we also owned several hundred uh, cell towers and uh, focus on the core energy business. So uh, we acquired the original light tower and since then have acquired six other companies to build out a fiber network, fiber infrastructure from Manchester, New Hampshire down through northern New Jersey. And it's a pretty robust network that uh, stretches about 6,100 miles of fiber, um, high fiber count uh, fiber network. And um, about 2,400 buildings that we are connected to. And we, we add about four to 500 miles of network per year and probably uh, two to 300 buildings per year that uh, we expand mostly through success-based ex expansion, selling a customer and then building into their building. Uh, we've also undertaken some uh, speculative builds um, into markets where there is a lack of fiber, and, and we see an opportunity to expand our network contiguous to what we have, um, as well as um, anchor institutions where we uh, think that at some point there'll be a great, significant opportunity for the company. In particular, a lot of the IBM facilities, um, all the data centers that uh, have been popping up in uh, New York Metro and, and New England over the past couple of years, we have built into or are building into, sometimes with a customer and sometimes just on, on spec. So, um, you know, we sell to the same anchor institutions that uh, VTOP uh, award winners are, are connecting. That's, that's our business. And, you know, we look to build out the network um, and to, to achieve some acceptable return for the, invest, the investment that we make. Now, we, um, we also partner 
with NISERNET and, and others who have been awarded BTOP uh, grants. And uh, we think that's great business for us because we have an extensive network. We are in a lot of places where um, the, uh, the, the grantees have, would, would like to um, connect to. So, you know, we've got the middle mile, we've got the last mile to connect pretty seamlessly into, into uh, the locations. Um, and on the other side of our house, we have a retail sales organization that also tries to sell into these same institutions. So it, the, in, in some cases, we are connected to a, an anchor institution with a partner like NISERNET or another, and we have our sales organization who has sold something into that anchor institution um, that may not be a part of the research network or the, or the, the network that's being assembled through the grant. Um, and, you know, we think that um, the, uh, the, 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 expand, the expansion of the broadband uh, infrastructure and fiber infrastructure is extremely important. We looked at all the um, opportunities to participate in the BTOP uh, proposals. Some we participated in and some we did not. Um, the, the decision to participate or not was purely an economic decision. It, that some were in markets where we just didn't see enough opportunity over time to get a return on our investment and <clears throat> looked at the, you know, the cost of operating those networks um, as cost prohibitive or uneconomic for us to, to participate. There were some entire markets where we had planned to spend, um, to expand into particular markets and there was an, an institution or, or a um, consortium that was awarded BTOP funding that built a, a pretty sizable network, and we just pulled out of the market because we decided that all, most of the, the opportunities in that market were going to be connected on this particular network. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity for us to, to uh, get a return on our investment if we continued along with our expansion. So. You know, we, we have, I, I have mixed uh, uh, feelings and views about um, the, uh, you know, BTOP uh, grants. Um, you know, on one hand, it's an opportunity for us, but on another hand, it's a competitor for us. And in a competitive situation, um, you know, I, as a private enterprise, um, you know, I would, would, would prefer to be able to go into the market and uh, get a return on investment. but. Um, you know, I'm also supportive of the broadband deployment that I think is absolutely critical to um, the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the country and um, particularly, you know, the, the region here, which is so rich with educational institutions and hospitals and facilities that should be connected to a uh, regional network or broadband network. So, you know, I, I have a bit, you know, mixed emotions about... Uh, about the, the BTOP um, process? Well, <clears throat> we, we certainly wrestled with it. We, we ended up uh, not applying for, for BTOP. Um, I think it had the partnerships that developed along the way not existed. Uh, it might have been different. Uh, personal perspective on it, uh, New York State has got a tremendously rich research environment. It's got a large number of tier one research universities. It's got um, corporations who, that have research headquarters here like uh, GE and IBM and Corning. Um, interesting sidebar that uh, Corning, Corning Research is actually in painted post New York which views Corning as the big city, which is in the middle of nowhere. And so, and there's no, except for what they've got in the yards behind, there's no Corning glass running through it. So, you know, with this BTOP build, there will, there will finally be, on a competitive bid, Corning glass running to Corning. And Corning's an example of an anchor institution that I would like to reach for the research and education mission of NISANET that I could never build the business case for. Um, the Hudson Valley is another place I, you know, I would love to reach all of the IBM 
research facilities but this this expensive country to build in i i couldn't build that business case and and we're not in the business of providing service to a broader range of customers that you do so you know we couldn't do it without a partner is my view it's a different view for some of the some of the regionals that have taken on um, very significant projects often with commercial partners um, but there's been some pushback that's been going on in Mark's previous home state of Wisconsin right now, the uh, uh, WISCnet, the, our equivalent in Wisconsin, is under um, a great deal of legislative scrutiny and budgetary stress. Um, you know, the last I looked at the, the compromise language, the first there was language in the budget that simply would have ended it. And the, the last look looked a little bit better, but into last week I talked to Dave Lois, who's their executive director, and he said, no, we actually need new legislation because we, we won't survive if there's not some fundamental change in legislation. And that is a long, slow project because it means change of faces in, in the state government and then that new set of faces getting to the problems that are there. Uh, much more draconian things that are happening in South Carolina, for instance. Um, Tim, I'd like to uh, comment on Rub's yeah, uh, okay. statements. Which, uh, the uh, BTOP award, to make it clear to everyone, uh, really does emphasize the finances of the network because, as you know, the, it's a, a one-time government infusion of money to get started, but after that you have to make it on your own as a business. And uh, the proposals had to demonstrate that they could make it as a business. So. The other part is, uh, so, so it's not an ongoing government support program for networking. The other part is competition. Uh, the proposers had to show that they could not get the service they're looking for at, at a price they could afford, which was usually uh, considered very high as a, a barrier, uh, in, and still get an award from the government. But then that brings up the issue of timing very clearly. But it did bring new competition into a community that had nothing but a large bell phone company, for example, that would sell nothing but T1s by the month. It introduced new competition. But in terms of uh, your new design network, which is really following the sort of the r and &E architecture, it's a matter of timing. I think if you would have been there first, they would not have. Uh, Got that award, but I'm just speculating. I wasn't involved with anything uh, in New York. As to Wisconsin, I'll just give you a, a sad anecdote from when I was there many years ago. Uh, the governor's uh, chief IT director uh, ordered all state agencies to move all their computers to this new uh, data center they were building downtown on the lake shore. Uh, regardless of what you were doing, and so we were asked, we at the university that were a state agency, and were asked to move all of our uh, computers, not move the computers, move the applications from our uh, Unix servers and our uh, IBM supercomputers and things like that onto their IBM mainframe. So uh, there's history in that state of trying to uh, move things with a very heavy hand that uh, could not actually be moved. And there's still a little uh, going on, I think, with competition on, uh, with uh, incumbent network providers. The, <clears throat> the, the competition um, requirement or, or threshold was, was, you know, was a head scratcher for us in a lot of these, the BTOP um, proposals. Um, you know, there, there were three fairly significant ones in, in New England and uh, two of the three um, had available competition other than, than the Bell Operating Company. The cable company was there. Uh, one of those, um, Light Tower, FiberTech, Cox, and others were in the, are in the market. And um, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the existing network that's there is going to be overbuilt by the the consortium that won the BTOP grant. Um, so in a lot of cases, we were there, we were there first, um, and others were there as well. And um, 
you know, we, we just, we, the, the, the uh, competition threshold was, you know, not a lot of, uh, it didn't seem to be a lot of, or we didn't at least understand, you know, what the criteria was um, to, you know, what, what is considered underserved, I guess. Yep. Um, so it's, you know, in, in that case, that, that's where we would consider that a, a competitor. Um, and then, in, you know, some of the other ones were so far off the beaten path that um, there was never going to be any competitor or a, any alternative to the Bell Company. And, and the Bell Company was not going to invest in the infrastructure. As a matter of fact, the Bell Company is trying to sell those markets. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in that case, I, you know, that to me makes a lot of sense. And, and, and we are participating with the, the one particular in Western Mass to uh, connect them from Western Mass back to the rest, you know, to the infrastructure in, in, um, in Boston and, and New York and, and uh, the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, we're a partner in that respect. And actually, we're a partner in the other two in, in, the, in New England as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we view those partnerships as, as significant partnerships, and, and we're very pleased to be working with those, those entities. I wanted to bring a, another question up, sort of directed at, at you, Mark, because you and I have um, debated this. Um, it is, um, given the amount of time and energy that goes into looking at very specific needs for this relatively small, certainly compared to the whole range of community anchor institutions, number of institutions that are my board member institutions and others that, that are connecting um, to the research network. I, I'm not sure, and I've, I struggled with this, how we would keep our focus to adequately serve those institutions if we took on the challenge of building out in the southern tier of New York. And, you know, a good example of that uh, Jim Becker, who's the head of Ion, and I were going down to New York City, one to see the, the peering point in Manhattan, and I spent the whole train trip down on the phone with various people trying, in some cases it was people working on a research project that I was trying to understand or, you know, connection for a particular purpose. Jim spent the entire train ride down on talking to you know, a community or a CAI or something like that for, for the build. And both jobs had to be done. And, right. and that's part of the, the divide. And, you know, last night our speaker um, mentioned that, um, we were talking about this at, at lunch, that Lou Gerstner had an advantage when he took over at IBM because IBM was on fire. And Sam Palmasano had a much tougher task to, how do you motivate the company when it's pretty healthy? How do you bump it when it's pretty healthy? Well, I mean, the, the problems that we've started to work on, on like this high performance computing consortium, one of them is the fact that the world is on fire. It's getting too hot and we've got huge problems. How do, how do we take that on and also take on the appropriate but nonetheless time-consuming um, tasks of reaching remote areas unless you completely change the company or you, you know, quadruple in size. And I, I don't, I still don't know an answer to that. Just uh, looking at BTOP, some of the uh, nonprofit organizations or state governments, for example, really did quadruple their networking group or, or, and uh, take it on directly. Others, uh, and probably more commonly uh, would lay multiple fibers and divide them in half and do their traditional research and education networking on half, which is a huge <coughs> increase over what they had, and then uh, work with a, a private internet service provider or someone else to, who would manage the other half hey. for, uh, and connect consumers. An, ex an example of that um, is Pennsylvania, which got one of the big grants. Yeah. And uh, they are right now working to build both, I'm going to get them wrong, Penren, which is the network 
aggregate in Kinber is the RE network organization, That's I correct. think. I'm getting the names right. So they're trying to build both their own version of Nizanet in Pennsylvania and a partnership with you and ION as part of the, that club all at once, which is a daunting challenge. I, I think yeah. um, Kevin Maroney, who's the CIO at Penn State, is it, it's miraculous that he's there because I think if it succeeds, it will be largely because of his diligence and drive, but it's, but it's a big task that they've taken on. And, and it's for a state that was not, um, does not have a rich fiber infrastructure. We've got at least one Pennsylvania connector to Internet 2 um, at this mm -hmm. conference. And, you know, I don't know if you guys are going to consolidate to just one connection or, or not. I don't know what that's. But it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's a wonderful work in progress. But, um, you know, some of it's being done on, on loan. Jeff Reel from Penn State is on loan to Kinber for a year. You know, that year is... Is, is running out. So it, it's the fact that BTOP had CapEx and no OpEx is, you asked for proof, but I think people are, you know, they're sort of staring at it now. Did, do I really believe the argument that I gave? I think some do have it. Oh, no. I'm not sure about others. Most of the projects that involve construction used uh, private industry to do the construction. Right. Uh, if they are a uh, in some cases, the uh, academic consortium really engineered and designed the whole thing and managed the, the construction. Uh, it's much more common that a uh, networking company that knows how to do this kind of networking built the whole thing, received money through the BTOP to uh, construct it, but uh, then turned over half or some fraction of it to the academic consortium, the anchor institutions. And in some cases, in round two, for instance, you allowed um, purchasing of IRUs, which George has yes. done. So um, George lots us from Ocean. So it's, there's been a, a, a wide range. I, I'm coming back to the, the research mission, though. Um, you know, I, I'm much more concerned about what IBM is doing I can. Sp I have the luxury of spending my time worrying about what IBM is doing with deep analytics or the next mm -hmm. generation of supercomputer, than how to reach Yorktown Heights or Hawthorne. You know, happily that's done, and it and it's something that, you know, in both required time, in energy and in engineering and thought. So I, you know, for research network, I don't know how to balance. All. Uh, Chime in. Uh, coming out of BTOP, their capstone project was USU Can, that we mentioned. I think uh, that's a uh, nationwide, <coughs> sometimes built, sometimes upgraded uh, backbone that connects all the regional networks. And uh, then it was up to the <coughs> regional networks to connect both the community anchor institutions as well as any research uh, organizations they want and provide uh, backhaul for. Uh, consumer connection and everything else. But, so there, there's a considerable uh, uh, requirement on the re regional networks or their uh, commercial networks in those areas. What did it do for research networking though? One thing this backbone did is provide a 100 gigabit per second network for anchor institutions. Uh, that's a uh, course dramatically larger than available before. They actually, again, pull lots of fiber, many fibers, and so they have a uh, multiple terabit network in theory if the uh, customers can be lined up to do it. So there's a tremendous increase in capacity for research and education networking coming as a fraction of that project. Uh, just recently, the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs and Internet2 announced a new uh, energy sciences network, ESNet, which is the uh, main channel for Large Hadron Collider data and quite a few other experiments, that's uh, going to be operating at 100 gigabits. It's directly part of this uh, VTOP award that led to the us can right. infrastructure. I actually think, and Bill, you should correct me if I'm wrong in this, but I think most of the outflow from our network is through ESNet more than Internet2 right through the peering fabric. 
significant amount. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, at, at one level, though, this is an example of uh, what I earlier called a silo ES net, which was separate right. from NSF net, now uh, operating uh, closer than hand in hand, saving time, money, and effort for everyone, and they're both focused very much on research. The, the, the challenge is that that's not the only focus. When, uh, when the level three announcement came out, joint announcement with uh, Internet 2 about the new network that was being deployed, uh, Rob sent me an email saying, is there an opportunity here or did we just get scooped? Because it talked about, almost sounded like they, they were all connected. Like this network, it was a done deal. And um, in fact, there is an opportunity, but you're the last mile. It's not, you know, it's not a last mile that's in there. And um, it not demonstrated yet, in my mind, that it's self-sustaining, that how it, I'm, I would much rather have a say, look, having this bleeding edge, national research backbone is a good thing. The cost of the federal government was like $60 million, right? That's like 15 seconds of spending in Afghanistan. Just say, just do it. It's, it was a good thing to do. And in the work of reaching the community anchors is really gonna, is, is, is fundamentally local. It's going to depend on BTOP awards in some cases, not in BTOP awards in other cases. It's going to depend on a lot of alliances and partnerships, local politics. You know, in, mm -hmm. in New York, we reach the schools that we reach. We do it through the regional information centers, through the BOCES. We, we, we don't go directly to them. Other states, they yep. go directly to the schools, and there's sometimes very intense politics involved in it. I, don't think that much of that traffic in any one of the states is going to leave the state. It's mostly it's going to be local. There's uh, and there are uh, other states where the state government directly funds communications for K-12 and things like yep. that. Yep. Yes. But others we, don't. All, all <laughs> over the place. We we we're all, we yeah. really are all over the place. And uh, the 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 BTOP attitude towards all that though is uh, in the proposal they were to. Uh, the proposers indicate which anchor institutions they will connect and what, it, and what their financial plan is to be sustainable over a 20-year period. And so uh, they, during the period of their application, they thought about this problem and solved it at least to the degree that was uh, plausible to the reviewers. Yep. Uh, in New York, I, I can say we, we, we didn't try to do anything in the lower Hudson Valley and or on Long Island and turned out to be a really good thing because you'd already built to all those places. And, uh, and most of this, fun, well, the, the big grant in New York went to a company that's already been doing phone service. So, they, so their, their operational expenses are kind of built in to their budget. They don't, it's not a hard justification. I'd like to sort of turn it back to you, Rob. What's, what advantages or what role is there do you see for our working with Light Tower, we clearly need to reach various rich research, corporate research sites that we aren't reaching richly right now. Um, where do we go? What value does the partnership have? Would it be better if we just tried to get a, gotten a grant and we're trying to, you already heard my opinion on that, but trying to build in the Hudson Valley? Well, we, we, we have 2,000 miles of fiber in the Hudson Valley and, and uh, seven or 800 buildings connected now. And we passed probably 20,000 buildings. Um, so so we, we have the infrastructure in place today <clears throat> that we can build off of. The, the challenge I see is bringing the institutions together and convincing them that this is the smart thing to do. And then we put the, you know, the, the business plan in place to um, expand out and connect and, and bring them on to the network. Um, particularly in the Hudson Valley, this is the, the, in the Northeast, the Hudson Valley is the least expensive place for us to build fiber. We can build fiber for about 
twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars per mile. Um, in New York Metro, it's one hundred and fifty dollars a foot, so it's it's not even comparable. So, um, and because we have thousands of miles of fiber in place today, that are within you know one to ten miles of of the backbone, mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's a real opportunity for us to get in front of the institutions that we're not currently, or you're not currently connected right. to, and, and convince them that this makes a lot of sense. So I, I do think that, that there is a great partnership opportunity there. Um, if you were to go out and, and get a $50 million grant um, to replicate what we already have in place, except for you know maybe a couple miles of, of last mile, um, it would take years to do, and then you've got the ongoing operating expenses of running right. that network. Whether again, a BTOP would never give a grant to replicate if it was known. They, so they push you to IRU buy what's there, if if it indeed is there and is for sale. Right. Um, so that's well, you know seems to be that partially. Let me. Hugh O'Kane. Hugh O'Kane was the um, head of Lexant Metro Connect and O'Kane Electric, and uh, person you dealt with when you acquired the company. And he told me not long after um, that project was up and running and sustainable, was that um, he said, "You know, the businesses right now still think that a, a dial-up or T1 is plenty." And so he had to be willing to sit and, and wait. I, it's changing now quite a bit, rapidly. changing very rapidly. But um, I, I know that when we committed on the, on the build in, in New York City, we bet the farm. And, and there were some hard times. And there were people like Frank at the museum that committed early on, or Jane that committed for, for Mount Sinai, or CUNY. Um, Right out of the gate, um, Presbyterian was was a really important one, but we, we were hanging out in the wind, and the number that we needed wasn't thousands; it was a couple because they were big, and they were you know were going to, in the case of Presbyterian, multiple sites that they were going to be doing. But we didn't have room to go. We stretched as far as we could conceivably go, and um, and I, it is turning around now. If, if we'd done the whole thing ourselves, we'd be a different company because we'd be commercial, not not for profit, not looking just at, at research. But we didn't have the resources to last until now, when the, when it's turning around, it, which is one of the reasons that I felt that that a partnership really was necessary. It's somebody that could see a value in the people that would be part of it, that are worried about the same things we're worried about, as well as a broader customer base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, um, when we look at expanding the network, whether it's, you know, for to, to connect one customer or institution, we also look at the number of opportunities along the way, and we, we factor that into our decision um, to spend capital to, to build out the network. Um, you know, the, the, the other thing that the, the, um, the, the the situation we, we faced with in uh, the Hudson Valley, because institutions, customers, because the network is so spread out, there's a, a much greater operating cost to maintain and manage and fund that network than there is in, in Manhattan. So um, we... Um, you know, we have to pay poll attachment fees. We have to pay property tax on on the network and and the plant. Uh, we have ongoing maintenance expense. Um, it seems like in a lot of the rural areas, particularly in parts of the Hudson Valley, um, a lot of animals like to chew through our fiber, and a lot of kids like to go and shoot squirrels off the tele power lines. And sometimes it, it knocks out our fiber. So we. You know, we, we do have a fair amount of maintenance expense uh, in this particular region. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's if, if you're building a network and you're only connecting just 
you know, 100 or 200 anchor institutions uh, on this expansive network. It's not economical, but we can connect thousands of additional businesses that will benefit from uh, the broadband infrastructure as a part of the overall network uh, as well. And, and do you see that business side growing fast enough to justify, is there return on investment? What's the horizon before you think that there's really been a return on the speculative investment that you've made? Well, we've, we've done, uh, in the last two years, a year, two, two years ago, we, we selected five markets to expand into, and we were looking for a 36-month return on the investment. It's turned out to be about 28 months. Um, and then last year, we picked another four markets to expand into, and we're looking at the same, about a 40-month return on the investment, and that's turned out to be about 24. It just tells you that the, the demand for the products and services that we sell is accelerating at an unbelievable pace. And um, where customers um, are ordering a, 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 a 10 meg circuit three years ago, they want 100, 200, 500 gig circuits now. And in, in a lot of cases, we will, uh, up, will upgrade um, you know, we'll give them 10 times or 100 times the bandwidth, but not to charge them 10 to 100 times right. what they're, they're paying today. So it's affordable, um, not only to, to all of our customers, which are government, enterprise, healthcare, uh, carriers, which is about half of our business, uh, need it. Now they can afford it. So, you know, the, the um, re return profile on the bills has turned out to be much better than we initially thought. And is that mostly on the corporate side as a business as opposed to schools, libraries? No, it's both. Both. It's both and it's carrier. You know, 50, 45 percent of our <laughs> revenue is carrier. Um, about 22 percent is uh, education, uh, particularly here in the Hudson Valley, probably 60 percent. 50% of our non-carrier business is education. Um, and we, we see the, the, uh, the demand for bandwidth and, and connecting to additional locations just continues to accelerate. So it, it, it's easier for us to justify spending a couple million dollars to build out in a particular market. Return with that kind right. of quick return. Yeah. So and we, we spend about $15 million a year building out. Our network. So that kind of partnership is a way that you can focus on research and education. Y yes, it, it and is. still get the job done for all the sectors. And, and um, we could change conceivably so that we could look to serve the same entities that you do, but, but we wouldn't be is not that anymore? We, yeah, you know, well you don't and, have to either. And we, and we don't have to. I, I think that that's a, a really important. Uh, yeah, you got the uh, faster, affordable broadband for the commercial market, including public consumers, K twelves, and others, and uh, share that with high high capacity I, research and education, which just covers part of that footprint. I, I can give you a sort of a progress report on. Um, what's going on upstate that I, I think that they've, um, they've got, um, they listed a certain number of anchors that they were going to be reaching on that grant. And I think every one and a few more are in that, that, so that that list is completed. It's way short of the full list. And I, and I do think budget is still going to be a problem with some of these others. There are some places in New York are, um, remote from the fiber that's being built in, in the northern or, or yep. southern tier and, and hard to reach and not cheap to reach. And uh, there's still a place for microwave, I hate to say, but it's yep. true that high-speed microwave is a lot better than nothing. It's, so, a lot, it's a lot better today than it was yeah. a few years ago as well. We, we, we actually partner with um, a couple of wireless backhaul providers mm -hmm. where they'll use the uh, build, connect r very remote cell towers with microwave back to an aggregation point and right. then onto mm -hmm. our fiber. 
and the, the, band, the throughput on uh, the, some of the microwave technology now is pretty good. Right. Meaning what? How big? Is it ready for 4G? Um, well, the carriers are buying it with the anticipation of that it will. running 4G over it. Yeah, yeah companies like um, uh, Fiber Tower has been building for most of the wireless carriers. One of the wild cards in, in, in my mind is we're <clears throat> just on the education, the wireless device is going to warp what we're all doing because everyone has it. One of the um, things that I heard, and John, you should correct me on this Regents Advisory Council, I believe they said that almost every family, regardless of income, will have some version of this. So it means that if there's an education gap, it's not that you, that you aren't putting some kind of computer into people's hands. It's, you know, it's, it's the human side of it, that the, the technology is expanding very rapidly. I'm staying at the, the um, Marriott Courtyard, and they've got, one. They've got uh, free internet access in there, and I actually read through the, um, you know, the terms and conditions, and it said this is by an arrangement with AT&T, so I, I can't have wireless there in the end of AT&T. And the very last two lines of it said that, and if you were um, the CEO of a not-for-profit that's thinking about competing with AT&T, you hereby agree not to. So I apparently locked myself out of future grants <laughs> by using the wireless. <laughs> and, and this is Verizon. So I can use this to, to connect my computer. But we're not, we're going to be in this partnership regardless, I, I think. Um, yeah. Verizon has actually been, in lots of ways, a, a good partner. It's a, it's a love and hate relationship. We, we duke it out with them on terms, but sort of broad strokes. I, Ivan Seidenberg's taken some really gutsy chances with LTE, with FiOS, you know, that... They're a uh, statewide VTOP recipient in West Virginia, Verizon, with the state government. Uh, Tim, you've mentioned a couple things here that are sort of looking ahead. I'm, uh, VTOP, as you all know, was a uh, very short program in the federal government. It came from nowhere and is now almost gone. But the funding will go on for a three-year period total, but the uh, new awards and evaluations are really completed. I'm now at an uh, organization called Networking and In Information Technology Research and Development Program for the Feds. Uh, very difficult to speak as an acronym. But there are, uh, one of the things we do is coordinate network research across all of the federal agencies. We don't do the research, we coordinate the people that do it so they uh, sort of point in the same direction and know about each other. It's collaboration and cooperation. There are uh, three main trends that I see now for research and education networks. One is uh, more of the same, so to speak. This same organization, LSN for large scale networking, is still there and the joint engineering team is still there, but they've moved on. Uh, there's, several generations faster, cheaper, better than there were 20 years ago. And now, of course, you're focusing on other things like end-to-end -end performance and security and identity management and clouds and other big network topics. But the other thing that's happened, a greater change in our organization is we've got more groups now. It used to be just supercomputing and big networking. Now there's one called big data defined broadly, one called smart systems or uh, cyber physical systems, things like smart grid and transportation, high tide uh, test beds for medical information exchange and others. What these amount to is uh, application communities that are now focusing on the use of broadband networking. And so the uh, research involved here is partially in medicine, for example, partially in IT and uh, it's going to have a big impact on all the research and education networks in the long run. Uh, it's the story you've all heard. The, uh, everyone is using the network now for almost everything. The science is going into computation and data, so it's going to uh, dramatically raise the bar for the kind of service we have to provide. Uh, 
The other uh, thing you mentioned is wireless and uh, how everyone will have a smartphone. Well, that's pretty well true, and uh, almost every device will talk to every other device by smartphone or some other wireless technology. Like I just had my uh, smart thermostat installed in our house so that I, I can turn the uh, air conditioner on while driving into town. It's really so the power company can help uh, minimize power usage. But uh, one of our groups is uh, not working at, on uh, this, a uh, wireless as mobile access to the network. They're working on redo the radio communication protocols themselves, change the radios in the smartphones and uh, everywhere else to get more signals in the same spectrum. Because we're g going to run out of spectrum. There's a presidential proclamation about that, and our group is doing research on it. I, I found a month ago that there are 670 research projects underway in the federal government as we speak on how to improve wireless spectrum access. And then a final thing uh, that uh, NSF has been pushing primarily but starting to expand beyond, that's the Genie project, which is now uh, rolled up in one called Ignite. They, I, it started out as a way to let uh, computer scientists, network researchers, program routers in your network on the fly so they could try new routing protocols and new ways of designing the internet to, to make the real internet or a uh, campus networks into a big test bed. Uh, beyond that, though, it's, there's just the idea of uh, breaking apart routers, which are sort of the modern version of mainframe. They're large and expensive. Uh, cut them in half, have a set, the computer control part be one machine and the switch be the other machine. The switches then uh, can become uh, off-the-shelf commodities, very much cheaper, and the control will be flexible for innovation. You can try different things. Uh, for example, some kind of specialized large data flows that are different from someone else's large data flows. I was just talking to Dave Lambert, the uh, president of Internet2. He's describing his early days at Cornell campus here as CIO, where uh, they built their campus network sort of by hand, ground up with uh, IBM RS 6000s as the controller part of the routers. But the idea, there's a, a movement or at least a discussion to split those apart again. It could. Uh, Beyond, go beyond what the computer scientists wanted to do, which is experiment with new protocols. It could dramatically uh, improve the speed and decrease the cost again of networking. And uh, it's pretty well clear how that would happen in, inside a data center. The uh, verdict is out for how it would work on larger scale. But it's changing the economics of our research and education networking one more time. And that, uh, assuming that there will be some success in this that will uh, certainly ripple through all of our work, probably starting with the research and education networks. This is um, things like the open flow projects that, yes. are, that are going on, which don't have all the vendors way, signed on yet, yeah. and, and and which will make a difference if they, um, and, and we've done experiments, Bill Owens reminded me that uh, we did something like that, uh, what was it called, X-Bind, Bill? which was for ATM, the equivalent of OpenFlow a number mm -hmm. of years ago. Columbia invested yeah. in it, did all the right things, and, um, it, but it didn't, um, didn't become anything. Yeah. Of course, ATM turned out to be hard, hard to do IP over yeah. and there, ATM. This again can be an economic and uh, as well as philosophical issue for a router vendor because uh, they are the, I call them the mainframes, they're the mainframe producer the and sales, and they're uh, not that interested in replacing it with a rack of microcomputers. That's the fire IBM went through that you were talking about. Great. Uh, we have like five minutes, Bill, something like that. Yeah. Let's see if there are